Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we're bringing back Rich Harris. Rich, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, I'm thrilled to have you back on the show. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. I I love the way that you have approached kind of building for the web in general. So it's always a treat to get a chance to to pick your brain directly. Um, but for folks who aren't familiar, do you want to give us a bit of a background on on yourself, who you are, what you do? Uh, sure. My, my name is Rich. Um, I am I work on open source full time for a living. I'm I'm living the dream. Um, I work at Vassell. Uh, I I I do Svelte time svelte is a user interface framework that i've been working on for the last um six years seven years coming up on seven years um yeah. with yeah me, me and a bunch of me and a bunch of friends have been building it for a, a very long time now um and it's something that i built in a, in a prior career as a visual journalist so that I, I could do like very quick turnaround um, interactive graphics in a news context. Um, but it turns out that, you know, if, if you've built something that works well mm -hmm. in that environment, then you can build anything you like. And so Svelte and SvelteKit are these projects that allow us to build anything we want on the web. And I get to build it full time. That's what I do. Yeah. So I, I think I've, I've heard a lot of people kind of explain they've tried to articulate what it is that they love about svelte and i know that early on the thing that i heard all the time was the just the the first class support for things like animations and transitions um and so that you you said you were doing that as as part of building out like visual journalism tools uh how i guess you know it it, it very clearly is more than an animation library by the way that people talk about it and just seeing what it's been used to build these days. Um, but I guess a question that I've always had is a lot of times what I've, what I've noticed when using tools is that a tool feels like it was built for a purpose and then everything else got shoehorned in after the fact, right? And I get the sense that people don't feel that way about Svelte, that they, they feel very much like Svelte is the right tool for the job in a lot of different ways. And, and so I'm just curious, how did you approach designing Svelte so that it didn't feel like this is an animation framework that can also be used for other things? You know, the short answer is that we are really good at saying no. Mm. Um, the, the shoehorning effect is it's real. It's very real. Um, and I think what happens is, you know, and I've experienced this firsthand. I, I very much used to, to, to respond this way to feature requests is like you build an open source project and you release it to the world and you get your first users and you're like, fuck yeah, open source <laughs> baby. And then the, and then the feature requests start coming in. People are like, Hey, so this thing is pretty cool, but it would be really cool if it did X. And you know, we, we are kind of hardwired to seek approval. And so sure we can add that. Like, I, I guess it, it like makes the API a, a tiny bit, weird like it's a little bit of a special case but it's not that big a deal so we're just going to like meet this this feature request mm -hmm. and then another one comes along and it doesn't quite work with the other feature requests like they're slightly at odds or at the very least you've needed to expand your api surface area because you you didn't come up with an api that could serve both use cases and um you know if you do that enough times then you end up with this kind of jury rigged monstrosity and right. like I've, I've done that in my own open source projects. I've seen it happen time and time again, because it's really hard to turn around to, to people who like are taking the time to engage with your project on GitHub and are, who, you know, as far as you can tell, lovely people um, who you, you know, you, you want to be friendly to and say, no, we're not going to do that. Mm. Um, but if you do open source for a long enough time, you will develop uh, a little bit of a, of a thick skin about this stuff and and you will learn the value of saying i understand why this is important to you and i understand that what you're proposing seems like the most natural solution to to your problem but actually we're not going to do it this way we're going to take this as feedback and input and we're going to let it swirl around with all of the other feedback that we get and after a while and it could be you know a, a week it could be a couple of years we will have an approach that we think solves this problem in a way that is coherent with the rest of the framework. 
Um, Got it. That is how we have approached design. It's a combination of saying no and also just like, I, I think there is just an, an element of, of taste. Like we design mm. APIs that we are kind of aesthetically drawn to. Um, and so I, I think I think that's why it has that that sense of things sort of feeling cohesive and fitting together as opposed to just being a mishmash of different ideas bolted together. Yeah, I think that 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 resonates with me on kind of a like a philosophical level, right? Because I, I think that one of the the hardest skills to learn in any profession or or vocation or or calling is like when is the right time to edit this? Like, because there's so many ways to add ideas and to think of new things and to expand and expand and expand. But to make something good, you have to edit it. You have to cut things, right? There's that that classic saying for writing of like, kill your darlings. And and I think when, when it comes to API design or building software, a lot of times we forget that how important it is to, to recognize that like a tool is built to accomplish a set of tasks. And if you make it too big, it kind of becomes a Swiss army knife where it's like unwieldy and it does, it sh theoretically does everything, but it's kind of hard to hold and it doesn't do any of those things particularly well. And it's just kind of like, you're like, I'd rather get the purpose built tool. Um, and so I, I, I feel like that is a, it's a good like reminder to all of us to to look at like what are we actually trying to build and why are we trying to accomplish the things we're trying to accomplish and and you know does the thing that we're being asked to do now line up with the long term vision and how can we make sure that we get there in a way that like we don't break the long term vision for short term happiness and and so on and so forth. Yeah, the the kill your darlings quote is, is a really good one, and there's it, it reminds me of a similar quote in the design field, which is um, I'm going to butcher this probably, but like great design is not when there's nothing more to add, it's when there's nothing more to take away. Um, when you've whittled it down to, to the bare essentials, um, which is not saying, like, it's not an, ad, um, an argument for, for minimalism. It's an argument for breaking things down to, uh, like, the smallest surface area that, that, meets, um, that meets the goals. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, a lot of times, like, that's not what happens. Um, but we, you know, we we we, talk, we try to reject anything like beyond what we need. Yeah. Well, and and you know, according to the the feedback at large, it seems to be going pretty well because Svelte was was, I think, for the second year in a row, crowned the the most loved developer framework out there. Um, and you know, we we got to go with some caveats on like the data. It's a small data set. It's a pretty biased data set, et cetera, et cetera. But it's it's pretty unanimous. Like I've never heard anybody say I hate using Svelte. <laughs> like there, oh, there are I people have. who don't use it, <laughs> but have. you don't really hear people say like this API sucks or whatever. It's it's you know I, I mean and granted I'm sure you're you're very close to it. You probably hear the worst of the worst. Uh, but as somebody, man, I, I, I hear that all the time. <laughs> You know, Svelte is, um, in a way, it's quite a divisive framework. And so we, we don't try to read too much into the, the data because we are still quite small mm. in, you know, in the scheme of, like, so there's, like, the top four frameworks. There's, like, React, and I forget which is second between Vue and Angular. And, like, those are the three at the top. And then there's, like, Svelte way down here. And then there's, like, another big gap. And then there's, like, a, a, a bunch of others. Um, and so we're, we're like one of the big four frameworks, but we're not one mm -hmm. of the big three frameworks, if that makes sense. We have a pretty small user base. And as a result of that, most of the people using Svelte are people who have chosen to use Svelte. And that naturally is reflected in the numbers, like the satisfaction among people who have chosen to use your thing is going to be higher than the satisfaction among people who got a job and were forced to use your thing, right? And there absolutely are people who look at Svelte and like, I want nothing to do with this. And that's fine. We have no problem with people saying, this is not for me. Um, we just have a slightly different philosophy on how these tools should look and behave to some of the other frameworks. And mm -hmm. because of that, we are meeting a need that is not being met by other frameworks. Yeah. And so, so as you're, as you're kind of seeing this, this come in, um, that is a good point, right? Like, I, I, this is something that I've I've talked about in the past, and and you've articulated much more quickly than I would about how a lot of times what you see reflected in the hype cycle 
is a bunch of people who are they're choosing to learn something new they're choosing to try something and that agency gives them the ability to remain very excited about it they'll suffer through things for the sake of their own exploration and their own curiosity. But if you take that same code and hand it to somebody and say, this is your job now, maintain this, they're gonna have a completely different outlook because their agency was removed, right? They, they're now being yeah. told, you've inherited this pile of code. You didn't write it. You don't know why this was chosen. You just get to keep it running because that's what you get paid to do. Um, and exactly. I, I've watched that happen. You know, I think we've we've watched that cycle happen a few times. You know, I, I remember watching that happen with jQuery. I remember watching that happen with Grunt and Gulp and, and most recently Webpack, where it was, you know, everybody was really, really excited until people started inheriting projects of the, and then they were like, no, I hate this actually. I don't want to do this at all. I'm going to change it to the thing that I'm excited to try. And they had high satisfaction yeah. ratings for that before they handed it off to the next person who was like, no, I hate this. I want to try the thing that I want to try. <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, there's there's an industry in this of, of rebuilding everything every few years because everybody decides they want to try the the hype, the hype, the hotness. Um, but so, you know, I think the, the thing that is interesting is like, okay, you said you've been working on Svelte for, for seven years now. Um, how have you seen, like, are you seeing uh, any of that? Like, are people inheriting Svelte projects and, and, and struggling with it? Are you, are you seeing that people are having an easier time, a harder time picking up Svelte when they, when they inherit a project down the road? Uh, you know, we, we haven't heard a lot of horror stories, or at least I haven't heard a lot of horror stories about people being kind of f forced to use Svelte on, on projects that where they would have chosen to use a, a different stack. Um, candidly, I don't know that it's been around long enough that there are a lot of mature projects that people are, are coming into. So it's still, if not individuals, then at least teams who are making the decision, having looked at all of the different frameworks that Svelte and SvelteKit are, are what they want to use. But you know it, it'll happen, and and we are we are prepared for that psychologically, uh, and in in terms of like providing people with the materials that, that they need to um, to understand how to operate. Like we've spent a lot of time investing in um, interactive documentation, for example, so that people can quickly get on their feet if they are dropped into a Svelte Kit code base, um, and and the entire framework is is designed to be as self-explanatory as possible. Like at, at numerous points, we've made decisions that favor uh, your understanding of the code base, like over a period of time, over like the things that might get someone excited immediately and lead them to adopt the framework. Like we, we value mm. retention over adoption, if that makes sense. We, we value people's long-term happiness over like the, the GitHub star count or whatever it is. Got you. Yeah. Um, and so when it happens, you know, we, it's not something that, that I think is, is going to phase us unnecessarily. Yeah. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, so the last time that we had you on the show, uh, I think we were, we were still a ways away from Svelte Kit 1.0. Um, I don't remember which, which version of Svelte, Svelte we were working with. Uh, so a lot has changed since then. And I guess, uh, this isn't. Uh, I'm not going to have you read the change log or anything, but I guess what are what are some of the highlights for you that are are new in the last I think year and a half, two years since since you were on the show. Um. So I it's been so long I can't even remember if we had started on Svelte at that point or if I we think, were talking about it. I think it. that it was uh, we had gotten past like it, Svelte Kit was a thing. It wasn't um, Sapper anymore. Right. But it was, right. I think, right around that um, point. So, uh, so yeah. So, qu quick recap for um, for anyone who doesn't know what these things are. Svelte <laughs> is a user interface framework, similar to you know Re React, Vue, whatever. Um, operates slightly differently under the hood, but it's essentially solving a similar problem. Svelte Kit is a an SS application framework, like Next for React or Nuxt for Vue. It's something that kind of answers the, okay, the what now question. You've got your component framework, but now you need to figure out server-side rendering and your project structure and your deployment story, and how do you deal with environment variables, set up a development server. All, all, all of that crap is taken care of you, um, taken care of for you by SvelteKit. Prior to SvelteKit, we had a project called Sapper, which was aimed at doing the same thing, but 
like we realized a couple of years into it that it was going down the wrong path and so we, mm -hmm. we started rebuilding on top of um on top of Vite. and so SvelteKit is our answer to the question how do you build an application with svelte um it does all of those things that i just listed and it does so in we think a pretty nice way uh, we think that SvelteKit gives you like a pretty tip-top development experience, and it also lets you build applications that are um, very fast, very robust, very resilient, um, and maintainable and pleasurable to work in. Um, and that's that's what's new since since we last talked is that we we have that we have uh, an application framework that is built by the same people building the underlying. UI, UI framework. So the two things like fit together really closely and we can sort of take advantage of the fact that we're developing these things um, in parallel as opposed to them being two related but distinct projects. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is It is very cool to see that it's it's sort of like the same, it's like the same set of maintainers, right? Like you, you, you're kind of designing these things in tandem, um, which is different right like i don't think we've seen that in in other frameworks it's, well, i guess uh, now we have it's becoming since... increasingly common in a way <laughs> like you know if, if you look at next for example um the people building next include react core team members like andrew and sebastian mm -hmm. and, and josh um and so there's like a lot of um very tight communication between the react team at meta and the react team at vassell and the next team at, at, at vassell like, so everyone is kind of going in, in, in the same direction. Um, at the smaller end of the scale, Solid has Solid Start, um, a meta framework built by oh, that's true, that. the Solid team. Um, al although you sort of get the impression that they were <laughs> kind of goaded into building Solid Start because <laughs> Ryan is all about like, you know, I want to use primitives and not frameworks, but mm. you'll keep demanding a framework. So I guess here's a framework. Um, so there's like different positions on, on the spectrum, but I think we were maybe the first uh the first meta framework that um that was built by the same people as, as the underlying framework quick is another example of this phenomenon mm -hmm. quick and quick city obviously built by the same people oh that's but, true yeah. um yes it it certainly wasn't the norm and i think it is increasingly becoming the norm it, it um, does and i think seem... part of the reason for that is that um V makes it a lot easier to do some of this stuff because it, it abstracts away a lot of the plumbing that you would have to do Otherwise, everyone can just build on top of Vite. Um, SvelteKit is built on top of Vite. Solid Start is built on top of Vite. Quick City is built on top of Vite. So there's a lot of the work that we would have had to do if we were doing it from scratch in the way that, say, Next did, that we just don't. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's absolutely true. And um, to me, that's really exciting. Like, it, it feels like, uh, it, similar to when, when a lot of the APIs in jQuery started to get built into the browser, it was like, Okay, I think we've decided as a as a community that like this set of problems doesn't really need to be solved again. We can just we can take this. We all agree that these are good APIs. Let's roll. And it felt to me yeah. like Vite sort of did the same thing around building frameworks, where it just sort of unified everybody in saying like, no, this is this is great. We don't need to really like do too much to improve on this. And obviously, that's not all inclusive because there are lots of of additional tools out there that are very similar to Vite, um, and that innovation is still pushing in a lot of directions. Um, but it was, it was interesting to see how quickly people really did unify around Vite as like, no, this is a great way to build a framework. Like let's roll. Um, yeah, it, it, it just solves so much decision fatigue and it gives you instant access to this ginormous ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, it's just kind of a no brainer. It's not to say that Vite is perfect or unimprovable, but it's so good that like, why would you bother like doing all that yourself? And we're seeing the same sort of, what's the what's the phrase, conceptual compression or, or whatever it is. That's happening at the platform level too. Mm. Um, nowadays, if you're deploying your um, full stack, air, air quotes, because some people get squiffy about that term. If you're deploying your full stack app to, to one of the big big platforms like you know Vercel, Netlify, um, Cloudflare, like all of these places, you're using web standard APIs like the Fetch right. API, request and response, headers, like all of these things. Um, you're just using the same APIs that you would have been using in the browser. You're not having to learn platform specific ways of doing things. And so across the board, we're seeing people consolidate on 
a shared set of primitives and differentiating on um, you know things like performance and developer experience and like all of these other things. It, it does seem like that's, uh, it, th this is my favorite phase in the, the development cycle where we, we kind of go around and around on this, right? But like, it seems like we, we, we have this moment where everybody converges on a set of ideas and then you get this sort of like Cambrian explosion of what we could do now that we're not wasting brain energy solving this one mm -hmm. set of core problems. And then we, we spread out and we say, okay, now let's argue about all the different ways that we're solving this new set of problems that we had energy to think about now. And then we'll come back together and somebody will come up with the abstraction that we all agree on. And then we get that next layer of, of Cambrian explosion. And it feels like we're in that moment right now where we're seeing a, a, a new huge swath of, of innovation in spaces on the web that previously we were all just kind of arguing about how to like, get things on the web, but it feels mm -hmm. like with, with the advent of like these really mature meta frameworks with things like Vite, with platforms that just take away the thoughts of like, how do I put this on the internet? You just push it to Git, it's up, it's, it's live, like don't worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the lowered cost of like serverless is free on just about every platform now and getting a database is free on a bunch of platforms and there's so many ways for somebody to just have an idea and go try. Um, and so it feels like we've kind of hit the next tier where everybody gets to go, okay, there's really no excuse for me not to try this. And then you build and we're going to see a new, a new kind of wave of like, oh, I didn't really ever think you could do that on the web. And I feel like these are always the moments that are really interesting before we see something that kind of changes the game forever. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to finding out what that is. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of wacky stuff happening at the moment about how do we um, do client server communication? Um, or do we do client server communication um and like some some of that stuff makes me like personally scratch my head a little bit but like as you say it's a cambrian explosion and there is so much like truly fascinating innovation happening that i think you're absolutely right that like some of these ideas are gonna pan out and some of them are not but in a couple of years we'll be like all right this is just how we do it now um, and I, I'm really excited for, you know, you had Sunil on, on, uh, recently, like we can start thinking deep thoughts about like, how do we integrate real time into this stuff? Because before you spent so long just getting to the, like the, you know, the, the bare minimum, um, right. of, of what you needed that like, you didn't have any energy left to think about real time beyond just like bolting it on in a few special cases. But, you know, maybe that's a thing that we can start actually designing frameworks uh, around. And so, uh, yeah, it's a pretty great time to be a web developer. And it does feel like with with the work that Sunil and, and companies like Party Kit are going to be doing, that this thing that that has become a big differentiator for a lot of companies, you know, like Figma with their shared cursors and, and kind of real-time collaboration apps like Miro and so on and so forth. It's, it's becoming, I, I think that's going to become less and less of a major differentiator. And just, as you said, part of the framework, we're going to see a way to throw together a collaborative app as like as easily right now as we, you know, NPM create whatever the framework is called, the way that we do it with, with Next or Svelte or, or whatever. Um, and I'm so looking forward to the chaos that that's going to allow because, you know, the, the, the ability to do things in real time and, and to just play, right? Like it's going to open a whole can of worms in terms of, of like safety and keeping people from completely abusing these systems. And it is also going to open up this huge world of play. And, and fun and connectedness yeah. that that I think we kicked off out of necessity in the pandemic with the innovation in spaces like video calling and um, remote collaboration and like okay now let's take it further what can it what can it mean to really do live music over over an edge connection what does it mean to play games in a way that's like solo latency that it's basically exactly the same as if I was sitting next to you or any of those things that that it, we're just we're this close right <laughs> and can I can I just point out two things. Yeah. Um, number one, I don't know if you're paying attention to the Twitch chat, but Dax just raided you. Hey, Dax. What's up, Dax? Uh, Thank you so much. And number, <laughs> yeah. uh, number two, we've been talking excitedly about innovation on the web for the last few minutes, and we haven't mentioned AI. How refreshing is that? <laughs> yes. I mean, like, cool. I love, I love some of the things that AI unlocks, but I definitely don't think that 
it, it, like, there are so many things that we can do that don't require large, whatever they're called, LLMs. You know, we we can we can do so many cool things and have so much fun on the web, and and all it takes is imagination, not not AI. Um, and I'm I'm very very excited that folks like you are, uh, and folks like Sunil and and Evan Yu and all these folks are building these primitives so that I don't have to ever think about how do I set up real time, how do I you know compile this this component into something that works on every browser like all these problems that i used to have to think i was you know i was like i'm just not going to build that site that's too much work <laughs> that's <laughs> the goal just, just el eliminate database. decision fatigue yes altogether Absolutely. except like so, so here's the thing there's like two different types of developers there's like people like apparently you and i um although i guess as a framework author i don't know if i can include myself in, in this constituency but there's developers who just want to build things that are fun and then there's developers who really care about the nuts and bolts. Um, like yesterday, uh, an internal refactoring PR on the Svelte repo made it to the number one spot on Hacker News because we're um, internally rewriting some code from TypeScript to JavaScript with JS doc. Like same, okay. same thing from, from the user's perspective, exactly the same outcome, but people just love to get into the weeds of how this stuff is implemented. And so... You know, it doesn't matter how many layers you compress in, into the foundations. There will always be people who just want to build all of this stuff from scratch. And I, <laughs> I, I don't know if we can uh, if we can satisfy them, but that's probably not the audience that we're building for. Yeah, I, I think you know, I as as somebody who is is formerly one of those, like I'm going to build this from scratch. I I think that as I've gotten older, what I've realized is that the thing that I really enjoy is making something and watching people use it. And so I've I've started to categorize building in in two ways. There's there's what I've started calling undifferentiated labor, which is the idea of I have to lay the foundation and get it up on the internet and set up CICD and all these things that are just they're exactly the same for every app. You've got to have data up somewhere, you've got to have a server up somewhere, the code needs to render in browsers, and there's nothing different about that. So I could, sure, spend a ton of time putting a lot of effort into that. But what I'd rather be spending my time on is the second category of things, which is like unique value. It's the, I want to build the feature set that I have in my brain that necessitated laying this foundation in the first place. And every minute that I'm spending doing something that I've done a hundred times before, because I've built a lot of websites, I'm not building the unique value of this, this particular website. And so I'm really embracing this idea of like, I don't ever want to do undifferentiated labor again. If I never have to read a Docker file, if I never have to figure out how to get something like scaling on Kubernetes or how to route an API gateway through a Lambda to my database, I don't care about any of that. It doesn't, it doesn't differentiate my app. It's just plumbing. Um, Amen, so brother. But here's the question. What if the, the framework that you have chosen to do all of that undifferentiated labor on your behalf does some things in a way that you don't approve of. Um, do you at that point just live with it or do you try and get the framework changed or do you just say, ah, this isn't what I had in mind. I'm going to reinvent some stuff after all. I, I think it's all, that always comes down to trade-offs, right? Like if, if they do something that is difficult for me to work with or like, you know, is against my morals, like that's very different than if they did some change internally that, that I'm like, I wouldn't have done it like that. <laughs> right. And I think there's a, there's a pretty big spectrum there between like, I, I dislike the way that they've decided to, ch to change this internal that has no impact on the external API versus like, they just broke my workflow versus, uh, you know, the founders did something that I cannot, like, I can't endorse. Right. And so depending yeah. on how you how you fall on any of those spectrum, then I think you, you know, you've got to make that choice individually. But for me, at least, like if somebody if I see a path to help, I I do love to tinker. Right. And if I see a way to, like, actually improve the foundation of something and it's it's not something that'll take me months to wrap up on. Like, I, I know at one point I was trying to con like contribute to Jest because there was a thing that I needed. And I was like, oh, if I can put this in the core, then that'll really help. And I just could not figure, I couldn't figure out that code base. Um, and, you know, this was years ago. I don't know if it's been cleaned up since then, but like, it was so opaque that I was like, I don't have time to learn this whole code base. And so I just ended up like not, not testing that thing that I was trying to test. Um, 
But in other cases, you know, like I've I've looked at ways that uh, like documentation is a big one. I'm always down to to try to oh I just figured out the weird thing and I'll write some docs. Um, but early on in a code base, like I love to do little PRs when the code base is still small enough and doesn't have all the all the edge cases covered and and the abstractions in place where I I don't know how any of that works. <laughs> Um, yep. but yeah, to, to answer your question, like it's a, a big giant, it depends, right? It absolutely is. I mean, so, so the thing that, um, the thing that I, th I think you discover when you try and build something as, uh, is that reaches into as, as many different pockets of the developer experience as an application framework is that you simply cannot meet everyone's preferences. There will always mm -hmm. be some aspects of the developer experience that some people are just, I don't want this. This is not how I would do it. And, you know, I kind of wish those people well, because they will go to a different framework and it'll be something else that, that they don't, that they don't agree with. Um, and you like, you know, maybe you just make things sufficiently flexible that everyone can, can bend it in their own way. But then the flexibility itself, it kind of runs counter to the point of, um, of having the strong conventions and learnability of, of a framework. And so that's the, that's kind of the, the, the interesting phase that we um, find ourselves at building SvelteKit is that because it does so much, some of the things it does, it does in a way that not everybody loves. But if we changed mm. it, it would be to the overall detriment because more people would not like the, the one thing that you changed. Um, hey, you know, so that's... Uh, that's like a fascinating phenomenon that, that happens at, at this uh, at this stage of development. And I think, so one of the things that I, I noticed when I was at IBM uh, is I was working with, you know, dozens of teams and, and we were trying to change the internal culture toward like different best practices. We had, we had a microservices thing that was kind of like multiple parallel monoliths and we were trying to clean this up. And, and it, re it required everybody to, to shift the way that they built a little bit. And what I noticed was there were people who had just decided like they were done learning and they didn't want to learn anymore. And so no matter what we did, they were going to be unhappy. There were people who were really excited that we were going to improve something and they understood the value and they were willing to put the work in. And then there was this group in the middle that that I don't really have a good name for for what that like how to classify them. But the behavior that I noticed was that they didn't really like the work. And they didn't really want to like build the thing that they were on the hook to build. And so they would really zero in on technical decisions as a way of procrastination. And I've noticed this across a lot of communities where people will, will spend a huge amount of energy arguing opinions or arguing about minutia in frameworks or websites or whatever, not because they actually care, but because it's, it's more fun for them to argue about minutia than it is to actually go and build the thing that they're on the hook to build. Um, and, and I think the hard part is, is trying to understand as a, or differentiate as a, uh, as an author of a framework or as a, as a creator of a tool, whether you are dealing with somebody who has a legitimate problem that is, you know, they're very excited to build and they're actually struggling, or if it's somebody who's just there to complain because they'd rather complain than work. Um, yeah, I, I think if you, you just described the tailwind phenomenon. Yes. <laughs> um it's like a magnet for for angry people on both sides <laughs> yes exactly i mean yeah i think like that's that's one of the the things that i repeat here a lot is like let's not worry about it let's just go out and build fun stuff um because you know if you if you hand me tailwind and that's what everybody chose for the project i'm going to use it if you let me make my own choices i'm probably not going to use it but that's not it, I, I, the tech itself is fine. It's just, I don't prefer, I don't prefer that versus just writing CSS. Um, but I don't, you know, it's not because of like some deep held moral belief I just whatever preferences and like preferences are the sorts of things that are, they're worth having until they prevent people from getting work done. And then you just kind of find the compromise that everybody can agree on and you move forward and build the thing. Um, but it's not always, it's not always that simple because, Sometimes people just really don't want to, they're like, I'd rather, I'd rather die on this hill than do any work. <laughs> yeah. um, we all know that. Okay. So, all right. We've been, we've been talking for about 35 minutes here. Uh, we got about 
like 50 minutes left in the show. And if you're up for it, I would love to switch us over into pair programming view. And uh, let's let's actually like bust out some some spell kit and let's let's try this out. Uh, so let me switch it. us over here to the pair programming view. And I'm going to just do a quick shout. Uh, we have Ashley with us today from White Coat Captioning. Thank you so much, Ashley, for doing the live captions. Uh, you can find that closed caption button down at the bottom of the, the player in Twitch right now. Uh, and that's made possible through the support of our sponsors. We've got Netlify, NX, New Relic, and Pluralsight all kicking in to make this show more accessible, which I very much appreciate. Thank you very much to the sponsors. Um, so, Rich, I don't know where the right place to start is, so I'm going to go to the Svelte homepage. And I'm going to ask you, what should I do first if, if we want to try this out? Uh, that is a good place to start. Um, this website is actually going to get a complete overhaul in the fairly near future. Nice. Um, yeah, so the, the, the work is ongoing and hopefully it's going to be, be merged fairly soon. <laughs> We're going to get dark mode, among other Ooh. things. Um, but the if you scroll down just a little bit, to the, the code block on the right there, where it says learn Svelte. So there's some code that you can copy into your terminal um, and that will uh, that will show you the way. Alternatively, if you wanna just try Svelte and Svelte kit out without faffing around on your command line and setting up okay. projects locally, then you can go to our brand new interactive tutorial site, learn.svelte.dev, uh, which is something that we properly launched about a month ago. Okay, let me drop this in the chat for what everybody. This is going to do. Okay. All right. This is um, this is going to set up a, a running SvelteKit app um, inside your browser, and you can go through the steps of this tutorial and learn about the different syntax in Svelte files, how Svelte components fit together, the features that you can add to your Svelte components, and then it will take you. To, uh, through SvelteKit, how you structure an application with SvelteKit. You'll learn about server-side rendering, routing, all of these other things. Um, and it does this in um, bite-sized exercises, which take anywhere from like 30 seconds to a couple of minutes to work through. Um, nice. None of it depends on the previous exercise. So you can like just get, come in, learn a concept, and, and, and step away. And Ooh, so if nice. someone wants to learn Svelte, SvelteKit, this is ordinarily what I would recommend them to do. Just go to learn.svelte.dev and work your way through the tutorial. Yeah, getting a lot uh, of a lot a of positive bit comments in the chat as there. well. People oh, are got comments in the chat. Yeah, I mean just people saying it's like best tutorial experience ever says uh Yanivis. Um yeah, uh, tutorial just like Knockout had says uh says Parasocial Fix. I don't remember. It is the... just like Knockout. This oh god, Knockout is it's still it's still live. The Knockout tutorial is still live, I believe. Um let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, learn.knockoutjs.com. Um, Knockout is, I don't know if it's the first interactive web-based tutorial, but this was very influential for mm -hmm. me when I was uh, up and coming as, as a web dev. Um, when I built my first front-end framework, Reactive, um, it, it basically stole this format. Nice. Um, and it's, it's such a great way for people to learn stuff because no one really wants to break up the command line and start mm. messing around. Like you just want to try something immediately. And, you know, you open the browser, tinker about, you close the browser, like everything's so easy. Um, and so when we first built Svelte, we had a similar tutorial to this, which you can still see on svelte.dev slash tutorial, but it's now been superseded by learn.svelte.dev. Uh, what's different now is that we have this technology called web containers. Um, mm -hmm. don't know if you're familiar with these, they're a, a very interesting piece of technology from Stacklets. basically lets you run node inside your browser, not like emulated node or anything. It's actually node, right. it's a WASM build of node running inside your browser in a service worker. And so you can build applications that depend on node tooling right there in your browser. And so this has enabled us to build a Svelte kit tutorial in addition to a Svelte tutorial. So That's like, cool. <laughs> you get a file system, you get server-side rendering, you get all of the stuff that would be so hard to build otherwise. Like yeah. it's literally running Vite inside your browser, um, which I, I nerd out about a lot. Um, and so because of that, when you visit the page, like it takes four or five seconds to boot up. But after that, it's exactly the same experience that you would have running Svelte kit locally. 
that's I mean that's just an incredible thing. Like you know, thinking about how difficult it would have been to do something like this even a year ago, two years ago, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's it's really incredible, and and I'm I'm loving. This is a whole other area that I didn't even think about when I was talking about big jumps forward. But like this idea of web containers and uh, what's the other thing, the firecracker VMs, and like just this amazing stuff that you can do that like very quickly get something up and it's just there, and you don't have to install stuff. You don't have to think about how you know you you don't need to know how it works. You just get to start playing, and I I think that's that's powerful stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so we're, so we're pretty excited about about this this site. So do you want to do you want to work through the tutorial or do you want to stand something up uh, locally? Uh, you know what? Let's spin something up locally because it would take a little bit too okay. long to go through the tutorial in anything like its entirety. So maybe if you want to open the terminal and are you a, a an npm user or a pnpm user? Uh, typically npm. Okay, so if you do npm create uh, npm create svelte at latest um, i always add the at latest maybe it's just superstition but i found that npm create gets um gets sticky sometimes uh Good. okay so it's asking you where you want to create a project right now it'll create it in the current directory which is probably not what you want unless you created yeah. a, a directory specially just gonna do i can't remember what we called the other one so right. you've got a few options here. Um, we've got a demo app, which has a few features that we can look at without writing any code. Um, we could do a skeleton project, which is just a completely bare bones setup. Or the third option is a library project, which I'm probably not going to look into today, but this is a way that you can build Svelte libraries using SvelteKit, which is something that is a little bit different to other frameworks. We actually want you to use SvelteKit to develop things like UI libraries and, and other stuff. Oh, um, basically using the same set of techniques as, as you would use to build apps. So okay. I would recommend either the demo app or the skeleton project. Okay. Let's do a, let's do a skeleton project. Okay. And, and you, you, got you a, mentioned this earlier as being something kind of controversial, uh, where you, you went to JavaScript with JS doc. Um, feel free to say no. Is that something you want to talk about for a second? Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people keep asking me about this and I really feel like I need to, to write it up somewhere. Mm. Um, most of the, like, a lot of people are interested in the topic and they're like, I-, I didn't know you could do this. How can we do this? And mm-hmm. it needs to be written down somewhere because it, it is a, a little bit of an under discussed thing. Essentially the TypeScript is, uh, I, I love TypeScript, but what I love about TypeScript are the types. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't love the writing and non-standard dialects necessarily, mm-hmm. although it is convenient. It is more convenient than JS doc. But what I love is having type checking and IntelliSense and having inline documentation. You know, like you hover over a function and it tells you what the function does and it tells you information about the parameters. That's the good stuff. I don't care about writing in a .ts file and writing stuff with, with that syntax necessarily. And so what JS doc allows you to do is use TypeScript inside JavaScript files. They're essentially just comments. Mm-hmm. Anytime you have a, a comment that begins with a slash and then two asterisks, you're opening a JS doc comment. And you have most of the power of regular TypeScript inside that comment block. And so the practice that I've taken to when I build libraries is I do all of the annotation inside these JS doc blocks. And then when I publish the library, I will generate type definition files from those JavaScript files so that mm-hmm. everyone else gets all of the type safety and all the IntelliSense and everything. And this comes with so many benefits. If I'm linking that library to another project so that I can test it, I don't need to rebuild it in order to try it out. I don't mm-hmm. need to use TS node in order to, to test my stuff. Like I saw a tweet just last week that said, TS node CLI doesn't work with node 20. That is a category of problems that I do not have because <laughs> I work this way. Right? I can copy and paste code from where I'm working into my browser dev tools if I want to just quickly test something and iterate on something. Mm-hmm. I'm using JavaScript the whole time. I'm not messing around with non-standard, non-standard dialects, but I still have all the benefits of type safety. And so about 18 months ago, um, we decided to move SvelteKit from t- uh, TypeScript, as in .ts files, to JS doc. 
a little bit of a controversial move at the time, but it has mm -hmm. proven miraculous for productivity because we can run our tests without rebuilding the framework. The, the, what you get when you npm install SvelteKit, you can actually look in your node modules right now after you've, um, or not right now, but once we finish this setup, and you will be able to see the SvelteKit source code inside your node modules. You're not going to be looking at some transpiled Got bundle it. crap inside a dist folder. It's just the code that we actually wrote inside your node modules. And that makes it super easy for you to understand what the code is doing. And if you want to make changes, you can just do it right inside your node modules. There are so many benefits to work in this way. It has been such a big productivity enhancer that recently we decided to do the same thing for Svelte. As part of Svelte 4, we're rewriting from TypeScript to JS doc at the moment. Interesting. OK. Uh, okay. And pe pe people just like look at us like, we're just absolute morons. Do we not understand that TypeScript is the way? <laughs> And it's so tiring, but this is why we're doing it. And so um, for the same reason, because I, I just really like the ability to do this. Um, mm. The first option when you create a SvelteKit project is type safety through JavaScript with, with JS doc type annotations. The Got second it. option is TypeScript. The third option, which I do not recommend, is no type safety whatsoever. Um, and so often what I'll do when I'm showing SvelteKit to people is I will actually take the second option because it's just quicker to do stuff okay. with TypeScript than it is to do it with JavaScript. Oh, um, I don't, yeah. But like, <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm sort of subconsciously trying to nudge people towards embracing JS doc because it's just a beautiful way of working. Uh, also, so we'll there is a chance this. that this will make it um, in like types will make it into the language proper. There's a, a proposal wending its way through TC39 at the moment I've that would that. add type annotations to JavaScript, the language, in the form of essentially comments. At, at which point it, I guess everybody's then got a, a little bit of thinking to do on, on how we're going to approach this, because if it's in the language, then doing it the TypeScript way isn't quite correct. Or, or is, it, is it TypeScript syntax making it in? I'll tell you what, I, we can all Google it's, this ourselves. Let's, let's play with Svelte. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like, it's almost TypeScript syntax. There are some elements of TypeScript syntax that cannot be added to JavaScript syntax. The grammars aren't fully compatible, but it's basically TypeScript syntax. Got it. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to follow the instructions, moving into the directory. I'm npm installing. Um, then we will set up the init. Uh, and then I'm probably going to leave it there for now. Um, so let me make this bigger and let's open this up. And why are you? There we go. Okay. Uh, all right. This is the wrong project. What am I doing? We want to be in this one. Here's our new project. So we've got source code. Right, we've got go. routes. We've got an app, a favicon that I'm just going to keep out of view. All right. Where where should I start? Where's the first place to kind of look to familiarize myself with things? So the first thing I would do is fire up the dev server. Um, okay. So I would bring up the integrated terminal, command J, and then npm run dev. All right, and this is just going to launch feet um, on 5173. Okay. And this is your, your bare bones Svelte, Svelte kit project. Uh, and that code that you're looking at, that welcome to Svelte kit code, um, mm -hmm. it's inside the source slash root slash plus page dot Svelte file. And you can find that by understanding the fact that the, the project structure and the routing structure are linked. But I'm actually going to show you a really cool shortcut that you can for finding where elements are defined. Okay. Uh, let me just double check how this works. So if you go into your svelte config.js. Okay. Uh, okay. And then below where it says kit, add a a new property called V plugin with a capital P. In in kit or after kit? After kit, okay. uh, yeah, top level config property. Um, v capital P plugin. 
Um, and then this is going to be an object with one property, inspector true. Okay. Okay, and if this has worked correctly, then uh, now when you hover over the application, if you press command shift. Command shift. Yeah. Uh, and then just hover over the elements. Like here? Oh, yeah. I thought it was going to be over right, here. And then just, All right. Yeah, and then just click on an element. It will, it will take on, you let me, to... Let me close this so everybody can see what just happened because that was incredible. <laughs> I've, I've seen people talking about this in a, in a few frameworks and I've never actually tried it myself and that's incredible. Yeah, this literally just came out of experimental status. Um, so this is like stable now. I'm, I'm actually wondering if we should have it default to true. The challenge, mm. of course, is that you can't find key bindings that, um, that are suitable for everyone. And so sometimes right. like people want to disable it and maybe it's easier if it's opt-in. But I cannot work without this. It makes my life so much easier. Um, yeah. it's, it's pretty beautiful. This was built by, by Dominic on the core team, and it's fantastic. Yeah, this is this is really really good. Um, okay, all right. So so we're off to a just a wonderful start here. Um, so we've got we've got a. Page. So let's make some edits. Yeah, let's make some yeah. edits. Okay. So we'll just say. Uh, hot re hit, hit, hot so reloading. All good. Hit, HMR. Like there was a time when that would be like. <laughs> but now it's just like, ah, we're using beat. Of course they get HMR. <laughs> it's just so nice that stuff like this is table stakes these days. I feel so bad for anyone whose framework does not work this way. That's yeah, that's really good. Uh, I got a question about arc. This is because I'm in, in dev mode. When you have a, a development, uh, URL, it shows you more controls. So that's nothing, nothing special. Um, Oh, okay. you're, you're, you're an arc user. I am. I, you know, I tried it because it looked weird and I, I can't give it up. Every time I go back to another browser, I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I'm missing arc features, man. I got to give it another, another, uh, well, I, I'll I tried tell it you a what, bit and then it, it just, you know, stick. what blew my mind on it was, uh, they implemented like the tab interface for like switching between your browsers. Um, yeah. that's, you just hit command tab instead of, or sorry, control tab instead of command tab. And I was like, okay, I'm sold. Like between that and the different spaces and stuff, I was like, I can't, I can't not have this browser anymore. Yeah, that's pretty nice. All right. Um, what shall we learn about first? Maybe, maybe let's, uh, you know what? I'm going to follow the structure of the tutorial because that way cool. I'm, I'm not going to miss anything obvious so the first thing that we'll do is create a new page All right. um, so in your source slash roots directory uh create another directory um and the directory is going to be the name of the root so okay. you can call it like about or something like that and then inside there we're going to have another plus page dot svelte file and that plus page is is a special component essentially that says this is going to create a root of our application okay so I can do something like about, and then if I come yeah, out here, it just matches the, the route here. Yeah. All right. Right. And okay. this page is server rendered. So it's generating HTML on the server so that you get to see content before any JavaScript kicks in. Um, what SvelteKit in common with, to be fair, most frameworks these days does that's different to how websites used to operate is that in addition to the server side rendering like a traditional web framework you also get client side routing but in order to see that we need to have some navigation that lets you go between different parts of your app and the best way to show that is probably by adding a layout with some navigation mm -hmm. so inside source slash roots let's add a new component called plus layout dot spelled layout if i can spell it right dot spelled Okay. Right, and you'll see that the page has gone blank. That is because our layout doesn't contain any content for the page. So inside here, mm -hmm. first thing we're gonna do is create a place for that page content to go. We do that with a slot element. Is it self-closing exactly like that? Exactly like that. Okay. Yeah. 
And so now it's just putting whatever your page is inside your main element. Above the main, let's create a nav element. Yeah, we can set like a, one of these, and then we'll do one of these, and then we'll put in, a, uh, let's a, see, one of, one of those, say home. I'm, I'm so happy that you just created an anchor element oh, automatically. God. You didn't start reaching for like a special yeah, link component do. or anything like that. It's just just HTML, just anchor tags. Yes, I have, that has definitely been something that has made me very happy. Um, I was trying to be clever and I deleted all my code. I have a Moonlander and I don't know how to use it. Okay. <laughs> so there's our yeah. there's our basic layout. We've got a nav, we've got um, anchor components, and now we can move back and forth between our links. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, another cool thing that is happening behind the scenes here, if you look in your source slash app.html, Okay. Then you'll see. So this is this is the raw um, HTML that gets sent to to the browser for the initial request. Um, you'll see that we have these SvelteKit.head and SvelteKit.body things which get interpolated with the actual content that gets server rendered. Mm -hmm. um, we choose to do it this way instead of having a component because it gives us uh, more of an ability to like to make very tight guarantees about like the actual bytes that are getting sent down the wire, which is sometimes important and which frameworks will sometimes like gloss over like they will strip out comments that have important meaning and, and things mm. like that so like we let you control the actual html and if you look on that body tag we have this attribute data svelte kit preload data equals hover um, and we can go to the documentation on kit.svelte.dev if you want to learn about that but essentially what this means is that when you hover over a link um, yeah, if you press Command K on that, uh, and then just start start typing data dash svelte kit. This one. Okay. Um, so it it tells you exactly how that behavior is um, behaving and like what you can do to configure it. Um, what it's doing is when you hover over a link, it's saying, oh, the user probably wants to go to this route. So mm -hmm. in case they do, in case they do make that navigation, first of all, I'm going to load any JavaScript that we need to take them to that route. And if it turns out that in order to navigate to that route, we need to load some data, which we'll come to soon, then I'm going to do that in the background. And I'm just going to store it in memory just in case they do, in fact, click. And then as soon as you do click, the navigation can be instantaneous. On mobile, we don't have hover. So hover, in that case, means that if someone puts their finger on, on the link, we will start doing that. And then mm -hmm. by the time they lift their finger off and it gets registered as a click event, then we've already done a lot of the work, so it makes the navigations feel instant. And stuff like that is like pretty hard to do well yes. um, without having a framework to orchestrate it for you. Like It's really hard to do that without just like indiscriminately fetching a whole bunch of stuff that you're probably not going to need. As someone um, who has played that game before, um, I, I have definitely attempted to write my own like link preloading thing. And when I did some measurement on how much data was being sent that wasn't used, it was probably 75% of it. So we ended up turning it off. Um, so I'm very yeah. grateful that, that, you know, the frameworks know enough about contents to be able to say, this is important. This is not load this, not this, um, that, that part has been hugely beneficial, I think, to the, the web ecosystem at large. Yeah. And, and you can control it. Um, you can vary the behavior for the entire app by having the attribute on the body. And you can vary it on a per link or per subtree basis, um, depending on what it is you're, you're, you're trying mm. to do. Because like in some cases, it might not be appropriate to preload anything. Like if you're building a, a, like a stock tracking app or something, you want up to the second data. So it's got to be only when you click that you get that. Got it. Uh, all right. What is what is next? Um, maybe we should do some more interesting routing. So we've got a route page and we've got an about page, but very mm -hmm. often um, the roots of your app are going to have parameters. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we might want to have a a blog page um, where the the post that you're looking at is a parameter of the route. Mm -hmm. And the way that we do that in SvelteKit is we create another directory blog slash and then inside that we would have a directory that uses square brackets in the name so blog okay. slash square brackets slug 
And then inside that, we would have a plus page.svelte component. Okay. All right. There we go. And, and so then, if you put some placeholder content in there. Yeah, we can just say like blog page and then anything that I hit here should work. So blog slash one and then we'll do a two. Okay. And then exactly. if we want to show that this working, uh, how would how would one like just put the, the slug in here? So we could put the slug directly in there. Um, or we could we could load some data. Let, let's do both just so that okay. we can see how this stuff fits together. Sure. Um, so inside here, create a, a script tag um, and add a lang equals ts so that we're able to write TypeScript inside here. Ts, OK. And now I want you to import the page store from $app slash stores. And is that a named import? It is, yeah. Okay, page. Oops, page store like this. Uh, from... Sorry, I, the just just page. It is a store, but it's oh, just oh, I got page. you, I got you from app stores. Yeah. Okay. All right, and so this is uh, a Svelte store, which is I don't know, it's kind of like a signal or an RxJS observable or something like that. It's basically an object that represents something that changes over time. Okay. And the way that we reference the contents of that store is by prefixing it with a dollar. So you could replace that blog page with, um, if you just put some curly braces, and then inside that, do dollar page dot params dot slug. There we go. So now we've got our, our pages coming in, and whatever we hit is what shows up. Exactly. Great. Um, but that's that's not all that helpful. Obviously, you're going to need to load some some data. Mm -hmm. And most likely, you're going to be loading data from the server so that you can interact with the file system, interact with the database, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, SvelteKit does allow you to load data from external APIs instead, in which case you can have your data loading function happen on the server and in the browser. But for this, we're going to have some data that only loads on the server. Okay. The way that we do that is by creating a separate module next to the page component called page.server.ts, again with the plus. Plus page.server.ts? Yep. OK. And so inside that module, we want to create a load function. Do export function load. OK. And then we just want to return some data. Uh, we could return um, some hard-coded data for now, like a title yeah. and a content. All right, so um, we'll, it so looks, we, we probably want oh, to It looks like slugs. you're returning an array there. Uh, oh, you do need to I return an object that? rather than an array. Yeah. OK, so we do an object. Yep. And you said a title, um, and we would say, you know, my cool blog. Uh, and then what was the other thing you said? Uh, some content. Content. Whatever you want, really. Um, and so here's a good question. How how does one approach content in Svelte? Like, is there, do you do markdown? Do you do, uh, are you expecting to import it from like a CMS that's going to give you back HTML? Um, are you getting content and having to mark that up yourself? SvelteKit is completely agnostic um, okay. about that. Like, there's a lot of different ways to, to do this and SvelteKit doesn't push you in one specific direction. Um, this is the sort of thing that, like you might build something on top of SaltKit that enables you to do this in a really easy way. Um, okay. But you know, I've seen people do it with Markdown files. I've seen people do it with databases. I've seen people do it with content management systems. There's really no right or wrong way to do it. You can have um, Markdown as your your pages. There's a project called MD Specs, which is like MDX but for Svelte. Um, oh, right, all of these right, things right. are possible, and and uh, they're they're equally valid in in our eyes. Okay. Uh, OK, uh, I just want to highlight a, one thing on this module before we go over to the page. If you hover over that load function. Uh, oh, oh, you know what's happening? I don't think you have the Svelte extension installed, maybe. Or maybe it's not I bet, up to date. I bet I don't. Let me see. Svelte, the official one here? Yeah. 
Is it up to date? Let me see. How do I check? Um, I don't know. 107? I don't know how to tell if that's up to date or not. I'll tell you what, here's what I can do. I can I can quit VS Code and open it again, and we'll see if that... Oh, but now I get to play the, where the heck did my brow, there it is, okay. Um, so let me go here, and I'm hovering. And we're just waiting for everything to fire loading, up. Loading, loading. You know, I... Ah, in interesting. Okay. Um, something is... isn't quite working as it should. I'm, I'm not totally sure why, but let's let's move on and, and just try um, getting that data into the component instead. Okay. Because I, I think you are on the latest version, but there might be some some piece of setup that's not quite working. Oh, what wait, I, wait, what wait. I wanted to, to show Here's, you is... Here that, it is. Um, I'm missing something. It says, the Svelte for VS Code extension now contains a TypeScript plugin. Would you like to enable it? Yes, I would ah. like to enable it. Now maybe things are going to do what I want. Okay, so you see you're, you're now getting some inline documentation. Mm -hmm. um, that's because uh, because this is a framework with strong conventions, because you have this plus page.server.ts file, Like we know what you should be able to export from that, and one of those things is a load function. Um, and because of that, we can just type it for you. We don't expect you to import the types and like mm -hmm. type your return values because we can just do that. It's the undifferentiated labor that you shouldn't have to spend time doing. The, and this so exactly, if you go to your... When you were talking about how the, the value of TypeScript is the IntelliSense and that you don't really want to write, uh, you don't want to deal with like writing TypeScript, you just want to get the benefit of TypeScript. This is the, this is the world I want to live in is the one where the the framework is doing the vast majority of this so that I get autocomplete. Like if I get autocomplete, that's really all I care about with TypeScript. And that's like, no joke, that is why I adopted TypeScript was so that things would autocomplete for me. <laughs> yeah. Same, same. Uh, all right, so back in our page, we've got to get the data from, from the server into the component. And the way that we do that in Svelte Components is by doing export let and then the name of the prop. And these okay. page.svelte components all have one prop, which is called data. Okay. So hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers that this will work. If you hover over data, it cool. knows what the shape of the data is. And so now and inside your, your H1, you can replace that with data.title. And no, no dollar sign on that, right? No dollar sign on that, because it's just a regular prop. And then below that, if you want to get the content, then you could do... And uh, look at it auto-completing. Yeah, data content. If you want to just pass the HTML directly from the server, then you can put, after the cur the opening curly brace, you put at HTML data.content. After the open, so do uh, at... Whoops. Yeah, so curly at HTML space data.content. And then it will just render that as HTML without... Oh, without nice. Any, Okay. Well, yeah. let's yeah, let's actually um, do that. Obviously, you've got to make sure that, sure that you're not do, doing that with untrusted data because <laughs> like XSS. Okay, so we've got uh, because content. you can't have a P inside a P. You'll, yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. So, uh, doesn't look I like I stopped my server when time. I restarted VS Code. So we're going to start that up again. Ah, there you go. NPM run dev. And there it is. There it is. Beauty. Oh, and we don't even need this right, page anymore. Sorry. That I mean, that's simple. Yeah. That's very simple. That's very nice. Um, and the the conventions, just kind of like knowing what stuff is, is also that's very nice. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what would make sense to cover in the remaining time. Um, we could talk about more server-side stuff. We could talk about how we do forms. We could talk about API routes. Uh, we could talk about um, middleware. We could talk about so many things. Um, so 
let's talk a little bit about so chat if you've got ideas please uh please do hit us up um we've got a question about using form actions a uh, question mm-hmm. about animation uh animation i actually have a whole other episode where that i did with scott talinsky on animation that i think is still accurate there's uh, have there been any big changes in the um the apis for animation no no okay. but basically then. Svelte itself is relatively unchanged in the last four years. It's actually one of the most stable (laughs) frameworks out there. Um, We are due for a couple of major releases this year. And so there may be some changes, some additions to animation APIs um, towards the tail end of this year. But Mm -hmm. it's basically as it was when you talked to Scott. Okay. So we've got three requests for forms, one for API routes, one for middleware. So let's, uh, how does Astro and Svelte play along? It plays along great. Um, I've, I've done a couple little projects with Astro and Svelte and it's wonderful. So let's do, yeah, let's do some forms. All right. Let's do some forms. Uh, here's an idea. What if we create a form for making a new blog post? Um, Yes, absolutely. Let's do that. Uh, all right. So what's the best way to do this? Let's see. Um, Create a new directory inside blog, call it new. Okay. New. And then we'll create a, another page dot spell. All right. And we'll just navigate over to that for now. Um, and we'll put in yeah. create a new blog. Yeah. Okay. All right, and we had a we had a title and we had some content before. So we'll create a form, and inside that we'll have an input name equals title, and a text area name equals content. Or no, title, title. Oh God, this is I made a mistake. I was like, I'm gonna write accessible markup. Mistakes, <laughs> yeah. mistakes were made. Uh, type text. I'm going to give it a name of title and then an idea title just to make that actually work. And then I'm going to just copy paste that whole shebang, replace all of these with content. And that's going to be good enough. And then we'll give it a button type submit and save. Okay. All right, so if you were to enter some data into that form and hit submit now, it would just uh, stay where you are. Like, it wouldn't actually change anything. Although I think it would update the query parameters. It, it should um, submit to the query parameters right now. It, it should, yeah. There it um, is. Because by, by default, a form is really just a fancy link. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it adds query parameters to whatever the... Um, the defined action is. By default, the action is the current page, and it will just put the data in the form elements as query parameters um, when you submit. And um, because SvelteKit just interprets links as client-side navigations, it will actually do the same thing for a form by default. So this is really good for things like um, search functions. If you have a, Mm. um, a form that updates a search parameter, then it will reload the data and it will put the new data into the page with your, your updated search results going to the server for that data if necessary. Um, but then it will just like update it in place. But that's not what we want in this case. In this case, we want to actually mutate some data on the server. And so for that, we need to use method equals post. What I like is that uh, I knew that that's where we were going and I haven't written a form in Svelte Kit. So it, we're already, we're leveraging knowledge that I already have here instead of saying like, okay, so then what you have to do is add this custom attribute that will make it into a post, right? It's like, no, just do what you do in HTML. It's very much the goal. Um, at one point we considered adding like a form component to do this, mm. but after a while we're like, what, why? There's <laughs> no, no reason for that. It's, it's daft. Just use HTML as far as you can um, and you can get a long way. But now if you hit submit, then what's going to happen is you're going to get an error message because uh, you can't post to this route. The, is, you have a page.svelte 
and that's just a, like a get root. So if you try and do something other than a get, then you're going to get this 405 method not allowed. Um, but that error message is saying no actions exist for this page. That's something that we can fix. Inside your root directory, let's create another page.server.ts. Inside new. Yeah. OK. And uh, this time, instead of func uh, exporting a load, we're going to export an object called actions. So export const actions equals. And we're just going to have one action on this page. So we're going to call it default. OK. And then inside there, uh, we're going to receive what's called a, a request event, which is an object with a bunch of different properties, one of which is request. OK. So if you type the curlies and then do request like that, exactly. Um, and then inside here, this is where all our server-side logic is, is going to go. Um, this is actually going to need to be an async function because we need to get the data from the form, and that involves oh, yes. doing an await. So the first thing we'll do is const data equals await request dot form data. Uh, I think request. you've got a cousin there. Oh, I sure do. And is this, this is a function, I assume? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, so form, this is like, like all just web standards. Um, this isn't Svelte kit stuff. This is all stuff that you can read about on MDN. So below that, uh, we could do const title equals data dot get title. Data get title and then we can duplicate that for content similarly for the content okay and for now we could try just logging those out and making sure that everything's wired up correctly okay and i assume that's going to show up in you know what console. we've actually we've actually missed a we missed something here we're going to need to add a an input for the slug unless Ooh, we want to derive true. it from the title that's true all right let's do it so we're going to add one more of these. Okay, and we, we could definitely derive this, but I think for the sake of ease and not watching me write a replacer function, we... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah sl sluggification is all fun and games until someone starts throwing like accented characters at you and all that stuff. Yes. I, I've, I've written a couple that like mostly work, but I haven't actually tried them against a an adversarial data set. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Exactly. So we've got, here we go. We've got a title slug and content, and we are logging that uh, here. So when I enter, when yeah. I fill this out, we should see it logged here because it's on the server side, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just going to do title slug content. And there we go. All right, so the data is on the server, and then it's reloading the page. Um, but that's that's obviously not what we want. We we want to save that data somewhere. We want to add mm -hmm. it to to our database, and then uh, and then we want to redirect people to that that new post. So let's do that in a couple of stages. Um, mm -hmm. We could, I guess, we could just store this stuff in memory, or do we do a, like a bootleg file system database? Yeah, I think I think we can just use memory for now. Like we, in in a real solution, we would we would have a database we were working with. Um, but for the purposes of demonstration here, we can just you know. All right then. So in that case, let's create um, let's create an in memory database. We'll do that by creating uh, a file called source slash lib slash server slash database.ts, and I'll explain each of those bits in part. Lib server database.ts, is that right? Yep. Okay. So the lib part means that this is uh, this is stuff that you can just access anywhere in your app by prefixing it with $lib. Um, it just has a, a built-in alias that makes it easy to have code that is referenced from multiple parts of your app. Okay. The server part means anything inside here can only be imported in modules that also run on the server. Anything in lib slash server or anything with a dot server dot ts or dot js suffix can only be accessed on the server. And if you try and import it into public facing code, your app will simply fail to compile. So this allows us to make sure that you're not accidentally leaking 
secret environment variables and, and things like that, it makes sure that you're not accidentally including code in your client side bundle unnecessarily, which is going to blow things up just like mm -hmm. a, a, a safeguard that you can't break. So inside here, we could, I don't know, we could do like const db equals new map or const blogs equals new map or whatever. Yes, yes. Uh, and then um, we could export a function called, I don't know, create that's going to take, yeah, our slug, our title, and our content. Here, yeah, we'll just do it like that. And then we'll send in a title slug contents. And, and then, then just add it to the DB. Uh, and the key would be the slug. And then we want to send in our title slug contents. Perfect. OK. And then we could create another function get that gets a, a post from, from the slug. Get slug. And we're going to return db get slug. Exactly. OK. And this one, because I don't want to type them all, I'm just going to any so that it leaves me alone. <laughs> yeah. OK. So now that's not yelling right. anymore. And we've got a the ability to Im So now I can import. And you said I import. Uh, yeah. You can. I mean, I, I think actually, if you just started typing create where that comment is, then it, it should auto import from from lib. Let's do it. That sounds Hopefully even better. If things... Create. There it is. Oh, so uh, annoyingly, it has not respected the alias, but we can fix that. Oh, it doesn't like my alias at all. Oh, database.js, not ts. Why, why is it? Why is it doing that? Mm, great question. Uh, TypeScript is funny sometimes. Um, what it looks like it's still a squiggly there. Any ideas why? It is saying it cannot find the module, so I think it's missing the the alias entirely right now. That's that's bizarre. There's uh, it, it, this is supposed to be in source, right? Something not going. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know why that is. There's uh, just a traditional live coding gremlins. Yeah. Do you want me to just um, run but it if for we... now? Well, let, let's see if it actually works. And then if it doesn't, then we can switch to relative. But... Okay, title, slug, content. All right. And so we will say new blog. And do one of those. Okay, and so now... hopefully, hopefully that's now existing. That's, that's now in our in memory database. Um, so if you go to the blog slash slug slash page.server.ts there, yes. um, then instead of return that hard-coded data, we could actually retrieve it from the database this time. So we can get. But we want to make sure that in the case where no data is returned, instead of just trying to render a non-existent post, we actually take it to a 404 page. So maybe if okay. we do const post equals get. And how do I and get that parameter out of the load the, function? The slug in there, good question. So the, the load function receives a request event just like the, the action did. And one of the properties of that is params. OK, so I can do request. Uh, no, it's just params, not request params. Just oh, params. oh, I understand. So the request is the standard request object, but the params is um, there. And and that would be You'll slug. notice that it it's typed it correctly for, for us. Yep, it understands that slug is the only parameter that you could have here. So if there is no post, then we want to throw an error. Um, so literally just type throw lowercase error. Oh, throw error. Not a new error, but lowercase error. And then import that from SvelteKit. OK. And 404 is the status. Do I need to send a body, or can I just leave it as a 404? Nah, it's fine. You, you okay. can if you want to customize the error message, but otherwise it'll it'll just throw a 404 error. Okay. Um, and then after that, just return the post. OK, so then what I should be able to do then is go to new post. And it Oops. 404'd on us. It um, didn't like that. 
Let's see, is that what I called it? That's actually a great question. Let me try again. Uh, we're gonna call this one test and say, I'm gonna put this into my clipboard. <laughs> okay, so then we should be able to go to test and there it is. Okay, I screwed something up there, but that's that's fine. Um, so this is, I mean, this is excellent. Like we've we've got the thing doing the thing. We have, but we're not done yet because right now we're posting that data and it's not taking us anywhere. It really should True. redirect. So let's add a redirect and then we'll just add the final touches to this form. Um, again, we're going to throw, this time we're going to throw a redirect. Um, okay. And it's going to be a 303C other. 303. Yep. And the location is going to be slash blog slash slug. Okay, so now when we go to new, we should be able to say anything, uh, anything, and it does the thing. So I think I, I have it the, does, the typo between my It does, but we're still not there yet because in order to get to that page, we have to do a full server reload, which like mm. it's fine, but it would be kind of nice if we could just update the content in place. Okay. And we can do that by just manipulating our form in a very small way. Back in the page component, if at the end of that form opening tag, we add use colon enhance, and then just import that enhance helper. Did that actually enhance? Yes, okay. You see it's added it, like if you save, then hopefully prettier is gonna make it look less garbage. I think I've screwed and something up not. in my config here, uh, which is not on yeah. Svelte, that is on me installing about 15 VS Code plugins per week for this show. Uh, so mm -hmm. my VS Code is garbage, <laughs> yeah. this is not a reflection on the framework. <laughs> uh, okay, so so we've we've enhanced, uh, and now when I do this, we should see it, it should reload without uh, without doing a full refresh. Exactly. Okay. Right, so the beauty of this is that you get the behavior of a form which you know works without JavaScript. It's, it's very robust. It's very resilient. This is how things have been done on the web for many, many years. But because we're using this use enhance action, mm -hmm. we could customize this behavior. We First of all, we get the reload free update, but we can also add some optimistic UI. We could add a loading indicator. We could add any kind of thing that we wanted that would give you some immediate feedback and make this transition uh, very slick and very smooth. Um, and this is what SvelteKit is all about. It's about taking web fundamentals, allowing you to build with knowledge that you already have, but then augmenting it in useful ways, like preloading stuff that we know we're about to need, or um, you know, navigating without doing a full server reload, which is gonna like reload all of your analytics scripts and all of that stuff. It just does the, the bare minimum that it needs to do to keep the page in sync with the data. Um, and it allows you to do server-side server mutations without um, a whole lot of ceremony. Like it's all built into the framework in what we think is a pretty logical and easy to understand way. Um, and because of that, like you're able to build things pretty rapidly in SvelteKit, we found. Um, yeah, I mean, we've we've made quite a bit of progress through, through something that, you know, I, I can see this taking an hour or more uh, to just scaffold something like this if we, you know, if you've got to write all of this code yourself and again, it kind of gets back into that undifferentiated labor of like, we've we've all had to write form handling logic and there's a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't want to do, like this redirect. I would just say, you know what? A full a full refresh is fine. <laughs> we'll just re yeah. reload the form and tell them that they can go, they can go find it in the blog list now. <laughs> yeah. Like you absolutely wouldn't be doing the speculative preloading and like all of that other no, stuff. Of course, not. like life is life is too short. Y yes, exactly. So li life's too short to build this crap yourself. Go go use a, a framework that does it for you. Uh, okay, so with that, we are we are at time. Rich, thank you so much for for showing us 
even just a little bit, I feel like we could go for for hours with all the features that just the chat was requesting. This much. Um, but yeah, so this is so for folks who want to keep going, uh, I'm going to push toward the tutorial. Where else should anyone go if they want to uh, if they want to go further? Um, they should definitely come over to our Discord, svelte.dev slash chat. We'll, we'll get you over to the Svelte Discord. Um, and like, our work is, is done in the open on GitHub. Um, that's where we do uh, like all of the pull requests and we talk about new features. Um, it's where people should certainly go if they encounter any bugs or if they have feature requests. Um, and they should follow... Svelte Society on, on Twitter. Svelte Society is the is our sister organization, which does meetups and conferences and um, produces a lot of video content and other things. And it's a really great way to find out what uh, what's happening in the Svelte world. Excellent. All right. So with that, we are going to call this one a success. Thank you one more time to Ashley from White Coat Captioning and to the sponsors, Netlify, NX, New Relic, and Pluralsight for uh, for making the show more accessible. Uh, make sure you check out the schedule because we've got so much good stuff coming up. And uh, don't make you know make sure you hit that hit that Discord link, um, hit the calendar, whatever it is that that'll make sure you don't miss any episodes. Rich, thank you so much. This was an absolute blast. Thank you all for hanging out today, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.